messages, but the subject of the Lordship Church. We, the, the Lordship Church has been called the unregistered church, the unincorporated church, the free church. We refer to it as the Lordship Church because there is an attitude, a perspective that we like to have, and that is what we're trying to accomplish with the church is not to is not to disengage it from something. We're trying to engage it with something. We're trying to turn the church into what God wants it to be. And in that sense, we refer to the Lordship Church as opposed to just the unincorporated church. A lot of folks, I think, in our day look at the unincorporated church as a, a separation from government. We look at the Lordship Church as getting the church back to where God wanted it to be. And whatever that means, that's what we have to do. We're going to look this morning at the historical and legal perspective on the incorporated church. And then this, uh, this evening, we'll be looking at a biblical legal perspective on the, on the incorporated church. And then tomorrow morning, Lord willing, we'll be talking about uh, four pictures and challenges that God has presented of the, of the Lordship Church and get a chance to see what the Bible says about the Lordship Church and the challenges that we face in the day in which we live. But this, but this morning, we want to deal with the historical and legal perspective. A short timeline of church incorporation, because I think there is a lot of misunderstanding as to where the thing came from. Back in 1327, Edward III of England chartered ecclesiastical corporations for charitable purposes. Interestingly enough, we still only charter ecclesiastical corporations for charitable purposes. And uh, that's one of the problems with being incorporated <coughs> as we go along. You have to become something other than a church to do that. In 1596, corporate legislation was passed in England, which created the corporate person, defined the powers, the capabilities, and the liabilities of the ecclesiastical corporation. In 1778, the Constitution of South Carolina, that should be an A at the end, South Carolina perhaps, but uh, assured freedom of incorporation for all Christian Protestant churches. And so as early as 1778 in our country, we had incorporation of churches. 1784 to 1798, incorporation acts were passed in New York and New Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and even in the Northwest Territory. So incorporation of churches is a long-standing situation here in the United States. Some interesting voices from history. Isaac Backus, who was a pastor, a Baptist pastor, as it turned out, in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, was a part of the Warren Association there, fought the whole concept of incorporation and entanglement for all of his years. And uh, after Bacchus was gone, the Warren Incorporation abandoned much of Bacchus' principles. While he was there, it was a different story. They had certificates there which were basically like tax exemptions. All right? One of the problems that we face a lot of times is people say, well, you know, I had a, uh, I had a situation years ago in Lansing, Michigan, where they had a big where they had a big meeting up there, and uh, 2,000 people showed up on the lawn of the Capitol because they were they were opposing uh, the state's requirements that uh, Christian schools do certain things. And so we went to that meeting, took a group of people from a church I was pastoring in Indiana at the time. We got there, and the first thing I heard, the speaker was up there talking about how we're going to go in, we're going to demand that they exempt us, and da-da-da-da-da. And uh, so I took my group and left. Uh, some years later, we had a uh, we had a fellow named Bill Green down in uh, uh, St. Uh, Saint Petersburg, Florida, and uh, he had a church in his house. And the state came in and said, "No, you can't have a church in your house." And uh, so we got involved in that with the law center. Got a, a phone call from Jay Sekolo and his organization, saying, "You know, we're fighting the same thing down here in in uh, in Florida." And we're trying to raise a half a million dollars to go to the legislature and demand that they exempt these churches and so forth. And uh, we'd like you folks in your case to join us. And I said, I'm not interested in joining. And the lady said, well, what do you mean you're not interested? I said, I don't agree with what you're doing. She said, how can you not agree? Well, it's a simple matter. You see, this whole thing of the filing of certificates, which was asking for an exemption, the back is hit it right on the head. He said this, it implied that the state had the right to legislate concerning religion. Right. Bacchus claimed that every act to exempt Baptists from religious taxes 
was so framed that they had to acknowledge such power if they were to be exempted, and such an implicit assent to the power of the state would wrong his conscience as much as to pray to the Virgin Mary. To request an exemption from the state, we first have to acknowledge the fact that the state has the power we're asking them to exempt us from. Therefore, we have to go to the state and say, yes, we acknowledge the fact that you have a right to tax our churches. What we're asking you to do is to allow us not to pay the taxes, so we are submitting not only to their jurisdiction, we are submitting actually to the concept that they have the right and authority to tax God's property in the first place. Now, here's another problem, by the way. Once you do that, then we've got these situations where people come along and they say, oh, wait a minute, you know, here's the problem. Uh, we, we had this exemption, now they took the exemption away from us, and now we're going to go out and we're going to object. We're going to stand up and say, you can't do this. Certainly they can. If you acknowledge their authority to tax the property when you ask for the exemption, you acknowledge their authority to tax it if they decide not to give you the exemption. Right? So, Bacchus hit the, hit the nail right on the head. He said, we're acknowledging their authority. He spoke vigorously for resolution. This is in the Warren Association back when, back when Isaac Bacchus was alive against incorporation. Bacchus won the day in the association resolved, quote, that it be earnestly commended to the churches belonging to the association by no means to apply to the or to apply to civil government for incorporation because we cannot consent to blend the kingdom of Christ with the kingdoms of this world. Notice the word blend, which I think was excellent there. James Madison was asked when he was president to uh, approve the incorporation of the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, under, the, under the tutelage of John Leland, a Baptist pastor from Virginia at the time, Madison vetoed the incorporation request of the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> saying this, because the bill exceeds the rightful authority to which governments are limited by the essential distinction between civil and religious functions, and violates in particular the article of the Constitution, which declares that Congress shall make no law respecting a religious establishment. This particular church, therefore, would be, would so far be a religious establishment by law. Madison said, if you incorporate a church, it becomes a religious establishment. It becomes essentially a state church. That's the reason why in the state of Virginia you could not incorporate a church until 2003, and I'll get to that before, before this session is over. However, the point being that incorporation is a religious establishment, is creation of a state-authorized, state-created, state-ordained, state-supported church. How else do you define a state church? The Baptist in 1791 argued, quote, the holy author of our religion needs no compulsive measures for the promotion of his cause, that the gospel wants not the feeble arm of man for its support. Amen. Now it's interesting in our day, and we'll talk about this perhaps in a little while, it is interesting in our day that 80% of the churches that the law center deals with on the subject of unincorporating their church and becoming